I found out when I was 66 years old that uh, Neil was my biological father. Uh, that gave me a lot to think about. Many times over the last five years, whenever I thought about my own behavior, I also asked myself the question, what might Neil have said or done in that given situation? So tonight I'm going to read a short story uh, that's part of a collection of stories I wrote 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, as I'm reading, you might think about what Neil could have done if he were in this eighth grade public school class. <laughs> Missiles, 1958. Every winter, a small number of boys disrupted instruction and littered the school with spit wads and other missiles that they shot from rubber bands. The effects could be seen, heard, or felt with unwelcome regularity. One of the science teachers labeled this period of time projectile launching season. In the early stage of this annual activity, paper was rolled into a rod about an inch long, which when folded into a V-shape could be slung from a rubber band. Targets and methods varied, but one favorite scheme was to fling the moist, moistened paper at windows, walls, or other smooth surfaces. If a hunk of rolled up paper is soaked in saliva for a while, it will usually paste itself to any hard, flat surface upon impact. Case in point was the ceiling in Mr. Taylor's social studies class. It had been pummeled by so much soggy paper it resembled the beginning stage of stalagmite for, uh, stalagstite, stalactite formation. As the weeks of wintering weather passed, some shooters upgrade their missiles and invented more powerful launching hardware. Commonly, this meant that bobby pins were shot from thicker, stronger rubber bands. Bobby pins made startling noises when they struck glass, metallic objects, and they could injure the skin or put an eye out, as I'm sure everyone's heard. At the height of this phase, one shooter was distinguished from the rest. His name was Don, and although admired by a few marginal students, he developed a dubious reputation among the general studi student body because of his skills. It was at this time that Don invented a new combination of missiles and hardware. He employed cut stri strips of automobile tire inner tube to pro propel heavy iron rivets that he pilfered from the metal shop. Don first used this new weapon in Mr. Taylor's class. That day, Mr. Taylor's history lecture was especially monotonous. Most of his students were not paying attention. While hoping for time to hurry by, I glanced around the room, which included a quick look at the growing mass of spit wads on the ceiling. Right about then, Mr. Taylor turned away from his students in order to write a significant date and historical event on the blackboard. While his back was turned, Don snatched the moment to fire one of his hefty rivets into the heating system ductworks. Bang! The sound was numbing. For an instant, there was total silence in the room. Mr. Taylor's knees buckled slightly, and his shoulders impul impulsively jerked upwards. He grabbed hold of the chalk tray to steady himself. A few boys immediately realized the cause of the sound and started to giggle. Other students seemed amused by Mr. Taylor's reaction to the noise. When Mr. Taylor turned around to face the class, almost everyone was laughing. Who did that? Mr. Taylor implored as he looked around the room at a few likely sus suspects. But as he expected, no one confessed. Don calmly looked around the classroom and then turned the page in the book that was open in front of him, as if he weren't interested in the pandemonium he had caused. Just then, Mr. Jackson entered the room and the laughter ceased. He was well known to students as one of the school's eager disciplinarians. The young teacher walked through Mr. Taylor's classroom every day like a cop on patrol. What's going on here, Mr. Taylor? asked Jackson, 
in a well-practiced, dictatorial-sounding voice. While Jackson stared intently at him, Mr. Taylor muttered something about a loud noise. Then Mr. Jackson slowly ushered him out of the room. A few minutes later, Jackson reappeared alone. He said that Mr. Taylor was not feeling well, and he commanded everyone to read something. He added that any book would do, and he coldly emphasized that he didn't want to see a single pair of wandering eyes for the remainder of the class period. I looked through pages of drawings and photographs in my American history book, and I thought about, I thought about the delicate old man who often lost control of his students. Mr. Taylor seemed gentle and kind, but also unsure of himself. That made him vulnerable to many types of harassment. While aimlessly thumbing through the book, I thought about Don's recent clash with Mr. Duncan because of a spitwad. Don had shot a folded up piece of paper at his friend, and Mr. Duncan's punishment was chilling. What would Mr. Duncan have done if Don had slammed a heavy rivet into the duck works in his classroom, I wondered. In Mr. Duncan's math class that day, I'd been struggling with a story problem in which the relative speed of one object was compared to that of another. Then I heard commotion. Mr. Duncan grabbed Don from under his armpits and had, him, and had begun to lift Don straight up in the air. The shock of being raised off the ground in that way caused Don's body to stiffen. Gravity and Don's wiggling were not enough to free him from the one-piece desk and chair combination. By the time Don and Mr. Duncan were at eye level, only one leg of the heavy desk still touched the ground. Mr. Duncan shook Don back and forth until the desk fell off to the side. Duncan lowered Don onto the hardwood floor and directed him to bring his notebook to the supplies room, which was located at the front of the class where everyone could see. Don reluctantly followed his teacher to the room. Very few kids, uh, very few kids were watching. Most acted as if they were working on the assignment. Attracting Mr. Duncan's attention by looking at him could be risky. After minutes, uh, Don and Mr. Duncan emerged from the storeroom. Help Don write his desk, please, said Mr. Duncan to no one in particular. In a moment, two boys had put Don's desk in the upright position, and Don was sitting in it. From my vantage point, I could see that Don was crying, and I noticed that his face looked misshapen. Don's mouth was packed full of notebook paper. Don sat almost motionless at his desk until the passing bell sounded. After class, he walked into the hall. Uh, he walked into the hall before removing the large mass of dripping pulp from his mouth. Don said nothing. He walked away from those who had gathered around and disappeared into the boys' lavatory. I hope uh, public school is a little better officiated than that. Thanks.